So I have a couple a couple questions to discuss today as well that came came in through the week uh, that we could talk about for group study. But the first one I wanted to talk about are some of the things that I personally do when I'm in physical illness or physical distress. And it's a caveat because one of the things I noticed from our old sessions that were old group studies that we would do and we had all kinds of people who weren't really practicing you know they were listening and who knows what else but they weren't really embodying a mindfulness practice or anything but they wanted to compare sicknesses well you just don't know what it's like to have this particular sickness and i'm like well no you're right i don't uh, you don't know what it's like to wake up and ants are running across your head and and you know all of the pipes are bursting and uh and it's just, we get into this weird uh, com competition. You know, the mind wants to compete with suffering. My suffering is so much worse than your suffering. And then I showed someone the video of uh, a mom who canceled their kid's World of Warcraft account. And they flipped shit. They were in absolutely severe psychological suffering just like somebody who had just lost a, a best friend or something, you know? So that's when I realized that this can do quite a lot and we can create incredible amounts of suffering over things that seem very minute, but it's inappropriate to compare because each person is going to have their own things to navigate. We're physical beings. I'm going to have mine. Donna's going to have hers. You're going to have yours. We're all going to have different things that we need to navigate to one extent or another. True, sometimes we hear these stories of that, that old lady who lived to 115 and she drank red wine every day of her life. And, you know, now we think revesterol and red wine is the key to, to youth. But, you know, those are, those are some rare examples. And I think it, those examples are perfectly possible. But like you said, uh, with the golf shot, we don't even need to consider it either way. We just need to focus on right now. So two things that helped me when I had that 2020 COVID and some of the things that I started to do when I had kidney stones. Now, keep in mind, when I had kidney stones, I was um, still really on, the, on the, the verge of understanding how my attention was connected to everything. So I was still kind of, you know, working with it because I... I I had to go to work. They wouldn't let me take time off. So I had to go to work with a kidney stone and come bathroom time. I'm like, this, this is, I don't want to be here. Like, this is absolutely terrible, but that's the environment. That's the work environment that we, we used to uh, put up with in the United States. And it's, it's woke ideology now that it's, 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 this is a tangent, but I read this thing that unions want and uh, things that they wanted for themselves throughout history, like better working conditions, better pay, pay time off. That's not woke ideology. That's fine. That's unions. That's cool. But the moment that somebody in a tech company or uh, in the service industry demands the same thing, they're like, oh, you're soft. And it's like, what? They're asking for the exact same thing that people in coal mines in the 1920s and 30s were asking for. Safe working conditions, a little bit of respect, paid time off. And it's just like, it's just so silly. That's a tangent. That is the definition of a tangent. So two techniques that worked best for me when I was uh, in the height of my COVID one of them is really difficult to describe, but I'm gonna give it a try. The other one's super easy. I'll start with super easy, imagination. So putting any attention on my body felt like hot death, but using my imagination, both superimposed and uh, scenario, you know, imagining when I'm not going to be ill, imagining what I'm gonna do with myself, the moment that I feel better, you know, I'm going to wake up and I'm just going to feel better and I'm going to go mow the lawn. No, let's take that back. Shana's shaking her head. She's like, that because never mowed the lawn. So let's, let's back that up. I'm going to do something. And that imagination was an opportunity for me to be deliberate with my attention, didn't really focus on my body. And it kept my mind from, we talk about idle mind when you're sick. That's the example of idle mind because you're not really engaging the world around you when you're not feeling well. 
but you're also not really doing anything physically with your body. You know, you're not really getting anything productive done. You're just laying in bed ruminating on your illnesses. And that idle mind makes everything much worse. So when I was laying in bed with that temperature, I was actually imagining like a, in my bubble of perception that things were changing relative to my temperature, like the world around me. Uh, and then I and then that would kind of take me into some philosophical things that I find interesting. But the number one thing that I was still able to do because of the imagination, I was present and I wasn't really focusing on the pain or how terrible this felt. And I was still able to watch my thought. That was the key, because if I wasn't able to watch my thought, my thought would take me places that made me feel worse. Does that make sense? And so, you know, I wasn't maintaining multiple points of directions. I wasn't expanding into the yada, 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 like I do now because I didn't feel well. So I just had to have at least one point of attention that I could hold on to so that I wouldn't let my thought go down rabbit holes. Does that make sense? Because it is still the same dynamic. It is more difficult when you're not feeling well to maintain certain points of attention. And the more we diversify our toolbox, the more we will have things prepared for when we're not physically well. So the more we prepare when we are well, the more we will have tools that are beneficial when we're unwell. And the number one reason we would want to do that, of course, I think that imagining health and imagining light and things can make you better. You know, to a certain extent, we are interacting with things that we don't quite understand. And I can't quite explain, but it's there. I know it's there. But I do know that by maintaining at least one point of attention, that gives me cognitive attention recognition to where I can recognize my own thoughts as they're occurring. Don't have to recognize my behaviors because I'm laying in bed sweating, you know, and feeling terrible. So there's not a whole lot of behavioral attention, but I was still able to watch my thoughts. And I was really surprised how often my thoughts, because I'm feeling ill, would want to go negative and fatalistic, so fatalistic, like, ah, this is the end. You know, I'm done. I have nothing left. And it's like, wait a second, I just have the flu. You know, it's like, hold on, let's back this up a little bit. And I will, and as I was telling Gene, that 2020 COVID before everything shut down, and I don't know if it was COVID, but it fit all of the symptoms. Every single one of the symptoms that we later talked about with COVID specifically, I felt. And the number one characteristic was the pain inside my bones. I've never felt that before, except for when I got my COVID booster. And then so I connected those dots. I'm like, this is weird. The only time that I've ever felt pain in my bones was when I had the flu in 2020, but I also felt it with the booster. So I do associate what I had in 2020 to some sort of version of the coronavirus, but it was the worst I have ever felt outside of kidney stones. So the first technique that I used was imagination to keep attention just on my thought. That's all I wanted to do. I wasn't really maximizing necessarily. I was, but I wasn't focusing on that. I just wanted to make sure that my thought didn't take me in a place that would make me even physically worse. Does that make sense? And that is tricky, but it can be done. But it's like that, that same dynamic that if we start practicing at 2 p.m., when we're experiencing a challenge, we're going to interact with that challenge differently than if we would have started practicing the moment we woke up. So if we only use our practice when we're not feeling well or when things aren't going well, it can still be beneficial. So I'm not gonna sit here and say that it, it, it will be worthless. It will be beneficial, but it won't be as beneficial had we been practicing throughout the day, just in between, making sure that we're not coasting. So that first technique that I used when I wasn't feeling well was imagination because I could imagine my dragons. I could have a talk with soul. And then of course, soul, you're not dying. You know, you're just, you're in pain. You're in physical suffering. You're a physical being. And then of course my mind would be like, well, I could try to be like Buddha and secede physical suffering. And, and then soul would remind me, Buddha's a story, you know, maybe it's true. Maybe it's not true, but it's absolutely worthless for you right now. So to sit here and try to compare yourself to Buddha or some imaginary uh, image of perfection, how is that helping you, right? It's making you feel worse. And so that dialogue with myself 
you know, help me focus my attention and my thought in a way that would be more beneficial simultaneously while feeling shitty. Sometimes the mind gets on this erroneous time scale and this erroneous goal scale. You know, we want to not feel shitty. Well, I get it. Of course, we don't want to feel terrible, but you do. And it is. And if our mind is more focused, we can minimize the pain, which maximizes the experience. And that's why I created that phrase called maximizing. Uh, maximizing is when you are experiencing a challenge. You're, you're, this is the best it could be right now. And I'm just going to run with that. That's the best it can be. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any, any questions about the first technique? Because the second technique is difficult to explain. So that one might be tricky. Also my opportunity to take a couple sips of coffee. So the second technique, I can kind of explain it this way. Sometimes, even in Champaign, when we when I was working in Savoy, it's really easy in Chicago. Now, the technique to do it is to pay attention to as much detail in your environment without judgment. A hallucinogen will help you do that without trying. LSD, for example, is a hallucinogen that you would actually have to take quite a lot to have three-dimensional hallucinations compared to something like peyote or jimson weed. You take peyote or jimson weed and you are going to have a three-dimensional hallucination type of trip that could damage your psychology. Then again, it could do something different. I don't think it's worth the risk. <laughs> I'm going to just go ahead and, and, and uh, do my mindfulness practice and go from there. Uh, but LSD in smaller amounts, reasonable amounts, everything, you're, first of all, your thought relaxes. You, you typically have less thoughts going through your mind because your sensory experience is screaming at you. You see every little detail. You're looking over at the wall and you're like, has that line always been there? Oh my God, do you see how geometrical this line on the wall is? That line was always there. That line was always geometrical. It always looked exactly how it looked, but the lens of perception has changed because of the substance. So that's just an example of learning to pay attention to the detail of the world without judgment. That's a technique. So when you're walking down the street and you're just looking at the world has infinite detail, there's just so much does that make sense? There's just so much detail. When you're walking down the sidewalk and you're looking at people's fences and their houses and their yards and our streets and our buildings and everything, a tree has all of these little details, so many details of the world. And I'm not necessarily talking about intending that. The, you can intend the technique of paying attention to the detail, but I'm not necessarily saying that we pay attention to any particular detail more than the other. Does that make sense? So the technique is to pay attention to detail. The technique is not necessarily to pay attention to a specific detail. You're just, you're just engaging detail without judgment because you can. You notice a lot of points of attention that are populating your bubble of attention. That kind of mm -hmm. your bubble of perception. Yeah. And because it's non-judgmental, you're just noticing so much. It's just, it's just all there. You're just seeing all of these different things. One thing that I noticed from doing that is that nature, um, in terms of like plants and animals, everything else is moving at a different speed than the human mind. The human mind is moving at a particular speed and the human activity in the human world reflects that. Does that make sense? The tree is not on that scale. The tree is is moving at a completely different pace. Although squirrels are pretty quick and kind of skittish, they're doing their own thing. They're not on they're not on the human scale. You know, they're they're doing things in their own time, in their own way, how they see fit. So we have this natural world of plants and animals that is moving at a completely different pace than the human mind and the human being. Does that make sense? 
And so it, it created this perception of mine that I called the timeless nature of infinity. And what I noticed is that everything is still moving and it's moving at a particular pe pace. We call that perhaps the Tao, the way that the universe moves. Ideally, we would like to synchronize with that. And then we're all moving together, which is optimal for adaptability. Really difficult to adapt when you're going at a completely different pace than everything else around you. Does that make sense? And so, for example, walking in the city, I engage the timeless nature of infinity. I see things moving how they're moving. And then all of a sudden I realize, or I, I guess I used to give the example of I'm walking on the same beach that potentially kings and queens and people of antiquity have walked on the same beach with the same attention, looking at the same sky with the same sun, right? It, it, there's so many similarities in that regard. Walking in, in Chicago, I have this realization that I'm in the third largest city in the empire that is currently known as the United States. And it, and it creates this thing where past, future, and present sort of converge. Does that make sense? It's a, it's a really interesting feeling because I can see that people in the past, imagine walking in, oh, let's say like Jerusalem or Rome, when it had like a million plus people, ancient Rome had about a million people. And did they realize their place in this stream of space-time continuum? I do. And it gives me certain insights, such as everything that we're looking at someday will not be there. Right. And it's it's weird, I guess, to kind of connect that to feeling sick. But when I do that, all of the fatalistic thoughts go away. That I'm just in this process, in the stream of time of everything else. And in a thousand years, there will be human beings that are going through something very similar to me. And a thousand years ago, people were doing something that was very similar to me. Although now we have anesthetics and, and uh, aspirin and things like that. So I'm really happy about that. And then appreciation and stuff like that can start to occur as well. But there is an effect that is a little bit difficult to describe. And I've done my best here, but I call it the timeless nature of infinity. And it is when past, present, and future exist independently and together at the same time. Because I'm in the present, I realize that this imagine or this it is mostly imaginary memory, which is kind of weird. But uh, because I don't know what Native Americans were thinking, right? I just know that that was a part of the past, and I kind of just fill in the blanks. So when I was in the hospital with my mom, and I'm looking out at all these trees, I didn't realize what I was doing was populating the my field of attention with infinite amounts of sensory data and i was activating the timeless nature of infinity and then all of a sudden i had this insight that out of the, all the people who have ever lived i get it and in this time period it's quite common to be in a five-story building but if you count the potentially trillions of human beings who have ever lived they didn't have that opportunity you know their their, their buildings were maybe two three stories tops they didn't get skyscrapers. Are you kidding? So that type of insight led to a type of appreciation. And it was when space-time seemed to come together as one and independently as at the same time. And that has to be a feeling because what I just said contradicts itself, you know, because we have individual time, yet we have it as one, but still individual. It's both at the same time. And the logical mind would be like, okay, what? Like, how could it be both at the same time? That doesn't make any sense. It's that feeling of the timeless nature of infinity. And that feeling was my go-to anytime that I start to not feel well. Whether recently with my pillow, my shoulders start to hurt. I populate my data by paying attention to things around me with no judgment, no agenda, and then it starts to evoke that feeling that I call the timeless nature of infinity. And what comes from that is a wild amount of insight and appreciation, despite my body feeling shitty. Does that make sense? The body still feels shitty. I'm just not focusing on the body. 
because that makes it feel a whole bunch worse. You're unmuted, Gene. Are you say, saying something? Yeah, I was going to say something. But... Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, it, it appears to to me, or the way I see that, is like uh, diffusion. Uh, instead of focusing on the narrow, the particular, the how I feel now, we bring into our consciousness all the detail that exists around us. And the thought about my health, my feeling, becomes diffused mm -hmm. because my yeah. attention is distributed over many, many points. Right. And it's not as concentrated on the particular item like my health mm -hmm. um, that it was before. So um, it's like diffusion to me. That, that the word, That's yeah. the word that comes to mind. I think that's okay. Um, I did do a lot of rule of three. Because, Gene, you might notice that when you're not feeling well and you keep reciting that in your mind, soul would tell me, as I earnest, you already know you feel shitty. Why would you continue to tell Shana? Why would you continue to think about that in your, I feel so terrible. Oh, I feel so shit. Oh, I'm so, and then Shana comes in. Oh, Shana, I feel so terrible. And Shana looks at me and she's like, fuck, I know that. Like, you don't have to keep telling me. And then, of course, she got sick and then we were both sick. Wait, it worked that way, right? No, Shana got sick first. She gave it to me. She brought it home from work. Everybody in the office got sick. And then Ernest got sick. And then I went to work sick because that's what you do. You know, you don't get to call in because you have a little tummy ache. So I'm sitting there uh, changing the fryer and uh, I'm changing the fryer and like my whole body just goes... I can't do this. Like I have literally no energy to physically exert. And the general manager, um, Orlando saw that. And he's like, Ernest, go home. He's like, you're working overnight. First of all, <laughs> there's going to be like three customers in the next seven hours. He's like, I can handle this. Just go ahead and go. So I do appreciate that. If I ever see him, I'll definitely let him know because I, I think that was COVID. And uh, I can't, I, I'll never forget that when I was feeling better, I went in and we were watching the news. This is a tangent, by the way. This has nothing to do with anything. But uh, we're watching the news and China's starting to close down. And I'm like, you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if they're forced to do that in the U.S. He's like, why would you say that? And I'm like, China shut down a city of like 23 million people. You know, that's a big step to make. I get it. Totalitarian authoritarian government, but whatever. He's like, nah, man, that'll never happen. 15 minutes later, we get the order that we have to shut down, that everything has to shut down. And he just looked at me. He's like, Ernest, that's weird. How did you know? And I'm just like, I don't know. I just got that feeling. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so hopefully that's helpful because each and every one of us are going to have a physical thing that we need to navigate. It's just the way it is. At one point or another, it, it will uh, feel icky to be a human being to a certain extent, especially in the world that we live in now. Uh, I I have a technique that that I was using um, that helped me, and and maybe it'll help somebody else. Uh, so when I wasn't feeling well, and 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 uh, I'm saying the things you were saying before. That is, the focus is entirely on how lousy I feel and where is this going and how do I get out of it and those kinds of things. And for me, going to sleep felt the, the, the best thing to do is just to avoid <laughs> and go to sleep. For sure. Uh, if, if I could figure out how to get that done. <clears throat> but what I discovered was, I, I don't know if I discovered it or I read it. I really don't know where it came from. Uh, I would breathe in, <laughs> it sounds crazy, but I would breathe in through my nose, whichever nostril was working at the time, like two short gulps of air and then continue breathing in after that so it would be two sniffs and then breathe all the way in and if you and and if i did that a number of times like four or five i could feel it right in the front of my head it's like the air oxygen was going right into the front of my brain which allowed me to focus on what that felt like and it felt different it felt different for that to happen. 
and within a few minutes, I'd fall asleep as I focused on what that felt like in the front of my brain. So it was the oxygen moving in through my nose, going right to my brain, because I, that, that's how they're connected, I think. And I felt it in the front, not in the temples, but right in the forehead. Uh, I felt that feeling and it felt very different. I paid attention to it and fell asleep. Uh, anyway, that was a technique that I used for, I don't know, a couple months when I couldn't go to sleep. Mm -hmm. I would remember, oh, oh yeah, yeah, the breathing. And within a few minutes, I'd fall asleep. Of course, I'd wake up in an hour or two, but <clears throat> still it put me to sleep. I'm curious what would occur if you did that when you're not sick. I think that's a great technique, you know. Oh, yeah. I do do it. <clears throat> you do do it? I, na I now do it during the day when mm -hmm. thoughts enter my head, not necessarily about my health, about a pl some place I don't want to be. Uh, some thought comes into my head and I start to focus. And, and then I remember, oh, well, let me try the breathing and see if that, how that works. Mm -hmm. And And it does, it seems to erase wherever I was and puts me in a different place. And now I'm, my sensory perception is, is activated and now I'm feeling instead of thinking. Excellent. So it brought me some time. Write that down. We'll call that the gene technique. I like it. I'm going to refill my coffee real quick. Uh, feel free to talk amongst yourselves, but I'll be right back. All right. I think that was a good start to the group study. Any Anybody have anything to add or? Uh, yes, Donna. Yeah, um, I was, as I was listening to your um, explanations, I didn't, you know, I was recently in the hospital and that was in a very acute form of distress for, <laughs> um, long time. It was really the waiting to be seen that was the most difficult for me to navigate because the fact that I went to the ER was because I was concerned that this was an extreme thing. And um, to redirect the thought from they're not taking care of me, how long has it been, that kind of thing. You know, uh, <clears throat> I didn't use imagination in any of that. And, I, and, and since then, I've been navigating the medication they gave me and, and healing. Um, and I didn't, I, I didn't use that technique. I didn't use imagination, but what I identified with was what you were talking about the uh, timeless nature, the, the timeless um, sense of, of nature. And, and um populating the data in the room, populating the data in the ER. And no, and, and, and I think in the past, I called it noticing principles, you know, noticing the principles of things. And I did not do, I did not do that to distract from paying attention to what was physically happening in my body. Because as a nurse and as somebody sitting in the ER thinking, am I getting worse and are they gonna treat me in time, which is the reason for going to the ER, was I have to keep one part of my brain on this point of attention, this, this condition that I'm experiencing, this imbalance, just to make sure that it's not getting any further in the extreme that it is so that I have to alert somebody that it, it's getting worse. So I just accepted the fact that you're going to wait a long time 
they are getting to you as fast as they can. And just keep one point of attention on that instead of the dream, streams of thought about it. What would happen if I don't, if they don't listen to me, how come they took that person first, this, you know, you know whatever. And, and um, there's a difference between comparing and contrasting. Those are the stories that you're telling about you know, your illness and what's happening here and the fairness or not fairness of it or the or the efficiency of it or the not efficiency of it or whatever story. The comparing and contrasting is different than noticing similarities and, you know, um, anomalies and, and um, what's the opposite word of anomaly? Similarities and, and anomalies. And so I do that because that's separate from the story of my illness. Comparing and contrasting is part of the story of me being the center of it. Noticing similarities and anomalies is, does, is diffusing, like Eugene just explained it. It's, it's a diffusion, it's a diffusion technique. But, and then it allows for, it clears your, it cleans your lens, it definitely does because it allows for you to see other things in play that have nothing to do with you, self, ego, and all that kind of stuff. So um, that I do a lot. And, and nature, it's harder because I haven't been walking. I haven't felt up to it and it's really cold out. But nature, but I have a whole little thing going on on my deck with the crows and the squirrels and craziness. And um, to the extent that I opened the door and the squirrel was like, oh, it's I was like, stop digging in my lawn. And he ran to come in the house. I had to close the door. Like the squirrel wanted to come in. I'm, I'm going a little too far now with the nature thing, Donna. Um, but but um, it allows in nature it moves at a completely different time. And that, but I feel like that's a virtue of the practice. It wasn't a technique I sought out it was because I had slowed my thinking, because I was doing similarities and anomalies, because I was diffusing, you know, um, populating my bubble of perception, but not over-focusing on any one thing so that there was a story about it, um, that I noticed how nature was, was <laughs> the, the nature of nature. And that the time frame was very different, but but I am part of nature. So therefore I can align with that. And it's a very peaceful, calming, steadying feeling. And I could do that while I wasn't feeling well. But at first, the first thing that had to happen in my head, same thing when I slammed my finger, same thing when I was, it was more acute in the ER, it's more challenging, but I know it has, it has to do with that I've accumulated some practice is accepting, getting, here was my feet on the ground, here's my breath and my nose, here's my, okay. So even if the, oh, I'm gonna die, no, you're not gonna die, devil's advocate, that thing. Yeah, I, I was talking to my cousin on the phone because she has some extreme medical things. And I was saying, when I was in the ER and I was crying, I was literally crying and I said, all right, knock it off, except I swore a lot, knock it off. So, you know, you're not going to die. And, and if you're going to die, is this really the way you want to go out? You're not going to know where the hell you're going. You're going to go in the wrong place. Your father's going to call your horse's ass. Where are you going? It's over here. You know, and then I, there was some humor <laughs> involved. In, if this is your time to go, is this the, really the way you want to go out? And, you know, it's accepting that this is the way you feel. This is what's happening now. And can you navigate and feel like shit? And you can you can, but um, yep. I, I just wanted to make the distinction really that I, I noticed while you were speaking is noticing similarities and anomalies is a re really great technique. Comparing and contrasting doesn't work because it makes you the center of everything. And then you can't, your your illness, you're not feeling well becomes much larger than, than what you want it to be. You want to take emphasis away from that and make emphasis on something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And for me, the thing that I noticed is my practice has to be there just enough for me to watch my internal thought processes. 
because that is, as per usual, the crux of the matter. Like that's the number one thing is where are our thoughts taking us? So, yeah, I think that's a, a, a good, you know, kind of round that, that part of the discussion out. Uh, an interesting segue is when Jean is talking about the forehead and then Donna's talking about imagination. Uh, and then we had a question about the destroyer of entertainment. So we can flash forward to a little bit of hydrostasy talk. So in hydrostasy, I get a little bit specific because people can either do this practice or they don't. I don't really care which, but I do think that there are particular techniques that will yield a particular derivative. One of those techniques is using superimposed imagination over the environment as the point of cognitive attention. So remember the four directions are sensory attention or what we would view as outside, internal or introspective attention, which, which what we would consider our physical body, breath, assuming that you don't have COVID and you're not coughing you know, a bunch because that's not going to be a pleasurable point of attention in that case. But still, we can monitor it just to check into it real quick, but probably not maintain that fourth one if we're not feeling well, because you don't need to maintain all four at all times. That's not really the point. The point is, is maintaining multiple points of attention simultaneously, whether it's four, whether it's two, whether it's three is, is quite irrelevant. However, when it is four, shit lights up. It gets different. Now, I will recommend excuse me, I will prescribe that if we're doing hydrostasy at a certain point, superimposed imagination is one of those points of attention, and it can be directly connected to the breath and other things. So when you connect the breath to the imagination, things start to happen. And we talk about consistencies. Nearly every ancient culture will agree, they will echo that imagination is the bridge between the physical and the non-physical. So we start to think, oh, well, imagination's not real. Imagination isn't a part of the shared experience necessarily. So what I'm imagining, Gene can't necessarily see, but I am imagining it. It is a machination of something. It's somewhere. It exists. So you're not just, you know, sitting there wasting your time imagining. I know that's the, the the other aspect of devil's advocate. But so first of all, I recommend using superimposed imagination as one of the four directions of attention. When this is done long enough, uh, is which a cognitive? The We're able to deduce, we're able to be logical, we're able to listen to music. Uh, actually, I would consider music one of your five senses. Um, but if you're not listening to it and you're imagining sound in your mind, then it would become that point of cognition. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what it that makes sense, and, and and maybe we maybe you could give us a really good um, definition of imagination because I just had a light bulb moment. I I always say oh, I didn't use imagination because I don't think anything that I make up isn't real. I don't I don't get in an argument with myself about whether that's real or it's just my imagination. Imagination. Yeah, no, sure. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't yeah. matter to me whether I really have this space that I am aware of in the center of my head. If I am placing my attention there, then I then it, it exists. Mm -hmm. Like so, I don't even consider it imagination anymore. It's like oh, I have this new awareness of this light. It's in the center of my head, and 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 if somebody goes, that's not real. You're just imagining it. Like, it doesn't matter. I am. It is my experience, so it's real, and and I don't ar have that argument. So I say I even use imagination, but I guess I do use imagination as a technique. It depends on mm -hmm. the definition. Sure, I think that fits the definition, but I'm being a little bit more specific, perhaps that maybe like when I breathe, I imagine the light and the energy coming up around my head. I'll imagine a dragon. I'll imagine soul. I'll imagine people who represent the essence of something and and Jean or Luna devil's advocate they'd be like well that's not really there right and then but does it matter you know does it matter to another person that they don't see it and then that's when the mind starts to get erroneous on the word truth and reality and so I don't use those words because it's benefiting me I'm feeling something from it it is it is a cause and an effect like how can we not 
categorize that as an action and as a thing. So, and yeah. You'll never prove whether it's real or not real. Maybe you're dialing into something that's very real and the only words you have to describe that are light and dragon, but it, it, it is something. And if you had more concrete words for it, would that make you feel better? No, it doesn't matter whether it's real or not. No, You're it doesn't. Creating something. Yeah, especially at this point, because we're talking about hydrostasy. So at the hydrostatic point of our practice, that is shouldn't even really be a concern. Like we've been doing this, we don't care. If Joe Blow says that you're, you know, you're, you're fat, you know, what well, you're, you're living in a fantasy or I'm, no, I'm not like w typically when people say that you're living in a fantasy, it means that you're projecting your mind to an imaginary scenario, which has its value as well. Now, when these four directions of attention are maintained long enough, there is a feeling of space in where thought used to be. And it is physical because uh, I've even had people at work, massage therapists, I'm like, feel my temples today. And and they're like, yeah, this whole area around your, your head is very relaxed. But let's say I was really thinking about something and I'm like, all right, now feel it. And they're like, Erna, we don't need to feel it. We can see it. What, what do you mean? It was because you know, my head is physically starting to contract. You don't even fake it well anymore. No, I don't. <laughs> You're right. Yesterday. So, Sorry, I was just going to say, um, yesterday I was walking with a friend and she doesn't know anything about these teachings and we were just chatting about uh, anxiety, which she suffers from about six in the evening. She was telling me that she gets a bit anxious. So we were talking about that and she was telling me, she's a nurse, and she was telling me that um, she has this imaginary process where she goes up into a hot air balloon and all her worries are hanging over the sides on ropes and one by one she cuts them all off and so that the balloon is floating up you know lighter and higher and I just thought that was really interesting and she says you know it took a while for her to really um to practice this and the more she practiced and this is it was her language yesterday the more she practiced this the more it benefited her you know that she could really get the feeling of or worries been cut off and her floating off in the balloon. And yeah. another thing I thought I thought about Jean when, when she told me this, because she plays the piano. And she told me that a double cleft, that's the curly note, you know, the one that has the big curl on it. Uh -huh. she, bre she breathes in when she's lying in bed at night to the shape of the double cleft or whatever it is, treble or whatever it is. The curly one, you know, starting her breath in the center of it and going right round up to the loop at the top and down. And I just thought it's, it's just amazing what people who aren't practicing what we're practicing, but they are in their own way. And of course, I was able to share share some of our things, the four directions and things with her. And she was very interested in it. So I just thought it was um Oh, yeah. beneficial to those two tricks of attention the cutting off of your worries and floating away mm -hmm. and the breathing to the cleft and the and the bottom line of that is it doesn't matter if anybody else thought it real or unreal because it 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 had a it yielded a result when i and the one of the reasons that i came to this is because when i was a, a child that's a weird way to say it, when i was a child when i was a, a little kid I would use my blanket as my energy shield. And I never, I was never afraid after that. Like I didn't, I didn't fear, uh, you know, ghosts or I watched a scary movie and I'm not afraid of it. Actually, the one that scared the shit out of me and where this came from, it was a movie called It Lives. And it was about a little killer baby. And the little killer baby climbs into the woman's bed. And when she gets in bed, the killer baby, of course, kills her and i'm like okay so now i gotta check my bed for killer baby until i die so instead i decided to use my blanket as an energy shield after i checked of course to make sure that the killer baby's not in there so i get in bed make sure there's no killer baby and then my blanket serves as an energy shield and i would imagine it as an energy shield and then i'd start to feel afraid and i'd be like no 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 i have my energy shield blanket now, somebody could say, Ernest, that is absolutely insane. It's not real. And I'd be like, well, I got to sleep, didn't I? I wasn't afraid. You know, these movies don't scare me. I didn't have nightmares. So it yielded a derivative. It had a specific result. Delusion is when we take our own imagination 
and we start to say that it applies to other people. That becomes a little bit of delusion because we don't know and it could get delusional. For example, I'm imagining Luna and I'm like, well, don't you see Luna? Like, what's what's your people's problem? Like, Luna's right here next to me. Jean, like, why aren't, why don't you, you know, so that's starting to get, you're starting to blur the lines between shared experience and individual experience. And eventually, I think in, in uh, the human species, that line will dissolve to a certain extent. And then we have what I call the evolution of consciousness. But I digress. So uh, the hydrostatic practice begins with learning to maintain the four directions while in your formal and informal four mode practice. So if you can imagine whenever you're walking, whenever you're sitting, whenever you're standing or whenever you're laying down, you are engaging three to four, although eventually it does become all four points of simultaneous attention. That is where I start with hydrostasy. Does that make sense? Jean, any questions about that? Or does that, does that make sense? No, I appreciate what you do. Yeah. Uh, without comparing and contrasting, I have there you nothing go. further to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, okay. And then what that creates when you do it long enough is space right here. And I mean that physically, I, I, physiologically, there will be a result. You'll see it. You'll be able to feel it. And then that becomes a point of cognitive attention with imagination, and it's interchangeable because it's difficult to maintain both simultaneously. It is still possible to a certain extent. Does that make sense? So I'm imagining and I'm feeling into this area of my brain because there's no words. There's space. I've created space. And when I engage that space with the light of my attention, it gets bigger. Does that make sense? And now we're creating significant gaps in the overall amount of thought. And I might change the word seeing because it's already been used by, uh, and I use it a little bit differently, but also somewhat similarly, but I call that the first gate of seeing. And seeing is when you change your lens of perception and everything that goes through it feels and looks and it's all different. We, it's, it's very difficult to look at the world in that old way that we used to because the thoughts are different. The way that we're perceiving the present moment is different. Again, a hallucinogen and other things changes your body chemistry, which alters your lens of perception. Therefore, everything going through it is a different output because it's, it's a different input if that makes sense, because the processor has changed. What's making the processing and assembling perception has fundamentally changed. Does that make sense? And it that's what sense. I would call that's the first gate. That's what I meant when I said it feels like a virtue of the practice instead of a technique that I'm using. It's, I feel like <laughs> there are some things that, that, I notice, I can't help but notice like, oh, you are navigating this emergency room visit entirely differently than you would have if you didn't have accumulation. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Sure, yeah. The, um, I feel like some of the things that you are explaining are, are virtue. I notice well, it. It's not clarify. that I am trying to utilize the technique. Mm -hmm. I'm using my techniques and now I have a different lens that I see through. So I notice, I allow other uh, dynamics of what's happening around me to be seen. I don't know how else to explain that. Well, first of all, it is somewhat, of, uh, I wouldn't say virtue, I'm going to uh, steer clear of that word, but I would say it is the result of an accumulated practice that it occurs in the first place, but it still requires deliberate attention to maintain it. So your attention could go anywhere else other than that space in your mind. Does that make sense? The practice is where that's coming from, right? So it is a result of the accumulation of the practice and the technique. However, once it occurs, it could easily go away if you don't give it the light of your attention. And when you do give it the light of your attention, it expands and it becomes even more profound. And that's what I call the first gate. Does that make sense? And then I'm going to get to uh, one of the questions about the destroyers, but I can't get there until some of this is understood because I don't recommend giving the destroyers any thought, any attention, one iota until we have done some of these other things. And there's a reason for that. 
Does that make sense? And here's the reason for that. And you, this, this picture should seem super duper familiar, but we have what I call the human being. <laughs> Actually, I don't call it that. Other people call it that. I didn't make that up. That's a weird way to say it. So we have the human being and that's looking like a little pipe. And the human being is a conduit. This is consistent among cultures separated by space and time, that the human being can act as a conduit between the seen and the unseen, the infinite and the finite. Now, this square is the lens of perception. Does that make sense? It is your lens of perception. It is your body. It is your mind. It is your experiences. It is your environment. It is everything. Does that make sense? So normally, uh, and I say normally, I mean commonly, it's coming through and it's okay until it gets into the lens of perception. And then it bounces around because we're thinking about stupid shit. And then maybe we're leaking a little power because we're getting down on ourselves. And it came in as, as a force. So I'm going over this line to, to show depth right? It's a strong thing coming in because it hasn't reached the lens of perception. But by the time it goes through all this bullshit we call our mind, it's barely trickling out. It, 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 that's not a good flow of energy. Does that make sense? Okay. So the more that we practice, especially when you practice some of the hydrostatic techniques when it's time to do that, that changes. The flow of energy between infinite and finite maintains its visceral quality. It maintains its strength. It maintains its trajectory in and out of the conduit. Does that make sense? In a manner of speaking, just the way that I'm, I'm, this is an analogy, you know, sort of. Now, the technique that I just shared with creating space in your mind, you have gotten out of your way. You're not getting, you're not plugging that energy up anymore. So things really start to flow through you and that can be felt. There's no getting around it. When it occurs, it, you can feel it. And when it gains momentum, that has a different feeling than brushing it. I have had moments where I'm doing my Tai Chi and uh, everything is really flowy and I'm feeling that to a certain extent. However, when I embody the four directions of attention and create space in the overall cognition, it gains momentum. And that momentum has a slight, excuse me, has a quite different quality to it. Same feeling, different quality. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, we could call this personal power. We're accumulating personal power and it feels like confidence. It feels like knowing. It feels like... It's a feeling, you know, that you have. You don't have to compare and contrast to other people. You just know. And if you know something, you don't ruminate over it. People are hustling themselves. They're like, oh, I know this. And that's why I'm going to have a debate with you for the next 75 minutes about it. No. You know, if you really believed it, you would just tell them if they want to know and then move on with your life. Right? We don't try to convince other people of things that we truly know and understand. There's no point. Unless they're asking questions, and then we're just having a discourse. But trying to convince somebody is actually trying to convince yourself because the othering will lead back to self. And that's warrior training. All that makes sense so far? Okay. And then we have three other techniques that we begin in hydrostasy. The sixth technique is an ongoing thing and can only work. It can only accomplish its, its goal. Those are terrible words, but when all of the other five are firmly in place, these stack, you can't be mindful if you're not present. You can't maintain emphasis if you never established emphasis because you were never present. These have to stack on one another. Does that make sense? That's why I don't really want to call them pillars anymore, because it doesn't really feel like a pillar. It feels more like Legos that you're stacking on top of each other. Does that make sense? Pillars is just something I heard from Tai Chi, the, and so I took it. <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't really resonate as much anymore because that's not how it feels. It feels like we're putting Legos on top of each other. And if you take one of those Legos away, you don't have the same thing. You, you, you're working with a different Lego structure. 
Does that make sense? Okay. The first technique is to determine how you want to feel. And this is something that I call emotional memory. We all have it. We can all access it. But if we're doing our four directions of attention and we're creating that cognitive space and that energy has gained a, a type of momentum and we feel it, this all becomes so much easier to see, so much easier to access. Remember I talked about the peace palace? Do you remember that? The peace palace in each room is an emotional memory. I remember when I got that computer in 1985 and I was just like, what the hell is that? Like, what do I do with this thing? Well, I plug it in and I put this little, this big old disc in there and now I can play a game. This is cool. I have no idea how this shit is working, but I like it. And I can remember that feeling. I, I can remember it without thought, without, you know, I don't even really need to recollect on the memory anymore because it's in one of my rooms. That's a technique. I'm not going to make anybody do that. It works really well for me. Uh, the waiting room in my Peace Palace is appreciation. I can't go to any other room without first going to the waiting room of appreciation. Does that make sense? Uh, imagine a palace that has um, like a courtyard or something, you know, in the middle. And you can't really go into any of the rooms without first going into that little courtyard. And of course, I'm using imagination at times. And I imagine this palace. And in this room is uh, the year two, no, uh, the year 1995, summer vacation. I hit that door. The warm air hits me. And I'm like, freedom, that feeling. I can recall that at will because I have created space in the overall amount of cognition. There's nothing stopping me from accessing emotional memory. Does that make sense? At least does it make sense? I'm not saying, you know, <laughs> uh, experientially, that might be the missing part of the knowledge. I'm sharing my experience, which is one part of knowledge, and I'm giving the information behind why it works. And then, of course, hopefully someday we can all gain the personal experience necessary for that to be knowledge that we can impart unto wisdom. Uh, wisdom being the action expressed from knowledge itself. All that makes sense so far. Okay. And I'm still getting to that, that question about the destroyers, but I can't get there without explaining the practice because we would be analyzing it. We would be thinking about it. We would be trying to understand it, comparing and contrasting, labeling and judging. And that is the worst ways to interact with the four destroyers. Okay. So the second technique is to create all that space because we're doing everything else. You know, we have our four directions of attention. We're using our imagination, sensing into the cognitive space. And then all of the sudden, the essence of the moment opens up to us. We can feel more in this moment. There's just something else to it. I don't know what it is. I don't have to know, but I feel it, right? And then Gene is like, well, I don't feel it. That's okay. You know, that doesn't change anything about my experience and how I feel. It's real to me. And of course, I don't expect Gene to say that, but Gene is my devil's advocate in class. <laughs> and it's a, it's it's wildly useful. So don't, I don't ever for one second want that to be observed or interpreted as a negative because it's an, it's important. It's a critical aspect of cognition. So, and I mean that literally, critical. You know, we have to be critical about certain things to see them from a broader perspective objectively. So that becomes a new room eventually in my peace palace. I can create a new room about what was it like to walk through Chicago and feel the timeless nature of infinity. There have been cities of the past. I'm in the city of the present and eventually there will be cities of the future. One day they'll be walking on top of where I am right now, or they'll be rowing a boat because it will be underwater. We don't know. But the bottom line is that it will change and it will change on top of change until it's completely unrecognizable. And then someday somebody's going to be digging and they're like, I think I found a structure and I think it goes down like 120 stories. It's like this weird uh, skyscraper, right? Because they dug it up and they found it. So that feeling is a new room that I can put into my peace palace that becomes emotional memory that I can determine whenever I want to. Does that make sense? And that's the first two techniques of hydrostasy. 
deliberate modulation and sensing energy to create new emotional memory. For the record, this is nowhere else. I've never read about this. I've never heard about this. This is something that I've put together through my own experience, consistencies and anomalies throughout cultures and yada, yada. Okay, let's say we're doing all of that and all of that is moving and we're doing our thing. Then we can start to work with this. Give me a second to draw it though. And again, this is just a way to organize it because shapes help me remember. And you know, I like the Mer Merkava. So here we go. <laughs> Where's my, oh, that's wrong. Ah, text. Uh, ironically, I spell intelligence wrong quite often. And eventually, we do talk about the differentiation between these three things. And eventually, there is no differentiation because this hydrostatic symbol creates the perfect sphere. And then they all come to one. Remember, Gene, when I was talking about past, present, and future existing independently, but also simultaneously? Same thing. Intelligence is not the way that people in the world use intelligence because they're interject, they're inter using words interchangeably and eventually none of it makes any sense. I was listening to Eckhart Tolle call politicians stupid. And I get it. He was talking to Russell Brand. And I think he was talking in a particular way because Russell Brand talks in a particular way. I don't know. But the bottom line is he was calling politicians stupid and he was interchangeably using knowledge and intelligence and yada, yada. Knowledge, the way that I use the word, has three parts. Information, personal experience, and the experience of others. When we have all three, we're more likely to remember what we've learned. When we remember what we've learned, we can act upon it. That is wisdom. Do those two make sense? I can't share my wisdom with you. That makes no sense. I can't share my action unless I'm just giving you my experience, and then that's one of the aspects of knowledge. So I'm not giving you my wisdom. I'm giving you one of the three aspects of knowledge. I guess the only way I could give you my wisdom is if uh, – you don't look both ways before crossing the street and I like push you out of the way when the car is coming. <laughs> but I don't even think that's a good example. Now, intelligence is different because the universe moves highly geometrically. If you put brain cells in a Petri dish, they will start to organize themselves. Every cell in your body has a type of intelligence. Snowflakes are a type of intelligence. Memory is a type of intelligence. Does that make sense? It has absolutely nothing to do with information and experience. But we can access it, and it will influence our behavior. It will influence how we interact with the world around us. So if somebody is truly intelligent, uh, let's subtract the word truly. If somebody is accessing intelligence, I could give them a puzzle that they've never seen before, and they're calm, and they approach it with peace, and they solve it quickly. That is intelligence. They've never seen it before. They don't know anything about it. They're not pulling. They've never seen anything like this in their entire life, but yet they're able to interact with it. Does that make sense? Okay. Give me one second. I'll be right back.
Okay. And I don't prefer the word advanced, but this is as far as my teaching can go. We're getting to the end of the matter. So next in this triangle, because we still have three points that I haven't named, right? And I am putting them in certain spots for a reason. Okay. Let's say that Gene has the desire to go play golf today, but he has other things that he needs to do, so he doesn't really intend to do it. Does that make sense? So desire and intention must be two different things because Gene can desire something, but then not necessarily intend to do it, right? And I'm using Gene because his camera's on and he hasn't been here in a while, so he's going to get picked on. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But no, I'm actually doing it, so I guess I'm not kidding. So the other one is will or the action that one takes. So Gene could have the desire to play golf, but he's like, you know what? I'm going to go about two o'clock and go play some golf, but then he doesn't do it. So the willpower exists independently from the other two. Does that make sense? And I'm not, these aren't absolute things. This is a way of looking at the world. It's the way of looking at the dynamic of the human experience. Okay. Now in this example, we are doing our, of course, we're doing our first three techniques. We're present, we're mindful, and we're deliberately intending our attention almost all of the time. That leads us to hydrostasy. In hydrostasy, we start to determine how we want to feel. We start to pay attention to the present moment in such a way that we can process new emotional memory. All that makes sense? And we're increasing that thing that I call personal power. And that's the energy is flowing through us like a conduit because we're not getting in the way anymore. Remember, we said, all you got to do is get out of your own way. Well, we've done that. What occurs? And so in the center of this, we have what I call personal power. And I'll put that right in the center. With enough personal power, the will is easier. The intention is clearer. The desire is going through a clear lens of perception. And then before you know it, intelligence and desire are almost overlapping. Intention and will are almost overlapping. Knowledge and wisdom are almost overlapping. And when they're active and we have energy flowing through without getting in our own way, we create the hydrostatic effect. It's this circle of intention, will, personal power. And we can start to interact with the four destroyers. So uh, the destroyer that was mentioned was entertainment. Just like everything, entertainment is not good or bad. It's not plus or minus. I hope you find me entertaining right now, <laughs> at least to a certain extent, right? Or you wouldn't be here. Like, we have to have some entertainment. Well, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe I have zero entertainment value. It's just information. I don't know. I think I have a pretty decent sense of humor that brings a little bit of entertainment value. So entertainment in itself is neither good nor bad nor plus nor minus nor up nor down. The mind likes to be entertained. Can we all agree? But we're not entertained all the time, not necessarily. We could still be at peace. We can still be happy. But we're sitting here watching something that we just find extremely dull. Like when I watch Shakespeare, I don't like the language. I just, I get it. You know, people love the, I don't. I just think it's wildly confusing. Can we just talk like normal people talk? Because that's how my language works. So I don't really, I don't really like Shakespeare. I'm just going to say it. I get bored. I'm like, I don't like this shit. Oh, thank you, Ida. That's what I was looking for, an agreement. <laughs> so the idea is that let's backtrack. Let's say that a person isn't doing this practice one iota. The lens of perception is full of comparing and contrasting things and stuff and career and 
problems and you know all of this competition with other people if they're a man then they're very likely unaware of male aggression it's falling below the level of recognition so they're gaslighting making everything about themselves even though they're projecting it to be about other people it's a wild hot mess that's the that's the cognition that we're dealing with on average that's when entertainment starts to become this thing that's imbalanced because there's no peace, there's no relaxation, there's no connection, the energy isn't flowing. And what does that lead to? It leads to the mind needs new, it needs more. And so entertainment becomes this thing that's filled with drama. Have you ever noticed that the vast majority of successful movies and TV shows involve killing massive amounts of people? It leads to Twitter. There you go. I I like uh, Keanu Reeves, and I still haven't seen, and I'm not, again, I'm not judging it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't go watch these movies, but he has that one movie uh, where his dog dies, and he just goes out on this vengeful wrath, and I get it. Like, I love my dog, so I can kind of identify with that a little bit, but uh, I can't remember the name of the movie, but he, the body count in those movies are innumerable like you'd really have to focus in to see how many people are dying boxing we could box with gear so nobody gets hurt and we could still do our sport and we can still have fun but nobody wants that because they want to see people get knocked the fuck out they want to see the violence so entertainment is neither good nor bad plus nor minus up nor down but when the mind is not balanced entertainment is not balanced and it starts to go a direction that is absolutely terrible so i played grand theft auto and i started to realize these things and i don't want to kill all that i started to just do taxi missions i would just pick people up take them to their location and i would get 100 or 300 bucks for it in the video game and that's all i did i listened to the radio i observed the traffic signals and i drove it like a driving simulator and i just played taxi cab and someone saw me and they're like, Ernest, what the hell are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just playing this game how I want to play it. I don't want to go around shooting everybody, killing everybody. It just, I like driving simulator. And it also had pool. You could go to like the pool hall and play pool. So I like that too. So entertainment itself is not bad. I have lots of things that I do that I find that are entertaining. But because the lens of my perception is more clear, because my energy is flowing, I don't need these weird forms of entertainment. Could I jump out of a plane? Probably. Will I? Probably not. Because I'm not seeking that type of entertainment. I don't need that thrill to feel a lot. Because I already feel that. I feel like I'm jumping at, well, maybe not. I haven't jumped out of a plane at 30,000 feet, so devil's advocate won't let me make that claim. But I'm feeling something, right? I don't, I don't necessarily need that. So the four destroyers really are the destroyers because of the mind, not because they're bad. Habit isn't necessarily bad. It's just when it goes unchecked below the level of recognition, it goes out of balance, it gains accumulation, and it will cause suffering. Who just said that? Donna just said that's the most hilarious thing she's ever heard, but then didn't laugh. I didn't even see you laugh. I had my head down on the table and I'm laughing very hard inside. Okay. Um, the, the, the fact that you had Grand Theft Auto and you just played Taxi Cab with it is just <laughs> the antithesis of what Grand Theft Auto is designed to do to aggressive poor aggressive males in our society and why it's so appealing. And the fact that you play taxi cab with the Grand Theft Auto is probably the most hilarious thing I've ever heard. Well, it has golf and tennis too. I can play golf and tennis. And I really like it because it's like you get this cool city vibe while you're playing tennis. I, I have completed about 4% of the game. Same thing with... I can't even work the controls, but um, I understand the addiction, actually. It's an addictive thing. When you said the kids flipped out when their mother took away, that's because... Oh, yeah. It's, it's like heroin that they took, well, mm -hmm. she took away from them. Yeah. So let's say that you want to paint a painting because you find it entertaining. 
do it. Let's say that you want to go to the museum because you find museums interesting. Do it. Let's say you want to go downtown or you want to hang out with friends because you find it entertaining. Do it. But can you also not do it and still feel entertained? If the answer is yes, you are free. If the answer is no, you are trapped. It's that simple. Does that make sense? And now, because our practice is pristine, these are prerequisites, by the way, and it's gaining momentum. And because we're doing the other two techniques of hydrostasy, which is deliberate modulation and sensing energy, all of a sudden this feeling of never being bored or otherwise at odds with the present moment occurs. And I call that dreamwalking. The reason I call that dreamwalking is because when you're in a dream and you are not lucid, you're not aware that you're dreaming, your central nervous, your nervous system doesn't know the difference. So you think you're about to get hit by a car, you get really scared. You're emotionally invested in the dream. Does that make sense? However, add a little bit of lucidity and you're like, well, this is just a dream. I don't care about that car. I don't care what these people think. They're not, they're not, they're not real. They're just in my mind. Like, I don't have to worry about all of this. And now I can just walk through the dream like I, mm, I'm, this is mine. I'm generating this. Well, we're doing the same thing in our waking scape. The generation is called perception. We're creating that perception. I am generating the world around me. I'm also interacting with the world around me. We call that shared experience. You know how some people's like the universe is all energy and you know we're all one and none of it's real. Go stand in front of a locomotive. Go stand in front of a train. And the closer that train gets, I promise it will become very real to you. We have to learn to maintain both and hold them both as truth. The train is real. And then again, the train is atoms and energy and vibration. And then they can become both harmoniously. And then who knows, maybe one day Gene will be able to stop a train with his mind. I don't know. If you do, I hope you get it on video because I'd like to see. Okay, so now we're dreamwalking. We're going through our day and what does dreamwalking imply? I have a job, but I'm not going to let my job weigh me down. I'm a biological entity with a trillion times a trillion synaptic connections. Why the fuck do I care about where I work? Why do I care about how much money I have or how people view me? That's, that's some of the most silly shit ever when you're in this state of consciousness. And it is an altered state of consciousness. We've altered it. Hopefully it becomes something common. And then nobody is worrying about these frivolous things that really aren't that important. And they wouldn't even exist if the mind wasn't tumultuous in the first place. Does all that make sense so far? So we have a clear mind. That's the first gate. The second gate is dreamwalking. When we're able to live our lives without the heavy burden of everything in the world. My basement's flooded. My friends don't like me. The boss is mad. And everything is doom and gloom. This is the opposite of that. This is I have a job but I don't have to have a job and I'll still feel freedom. I have friends, but if they get mad at me for some stupid reason, I still feel freedom. Freedom. Does that make sense? That's the second gate. The second gate is dreamwalking. And our lens of perception becomes infinitely more clear. The energy is flowing and we feel personal power. And now, at long last, we can start to interact with our behavior. And one of the best ways to interact with your behavior, because we can feel when something isn't benefiting us. We can feel when something is taking us out of balance. We don't have to confirm that with another person. You can hustle yourself and say, no, I'm fine. Okay. Just wait. It will accumulate. And it will, and then also locomotive hits you in the meantime, it will accumulate and cause suffering for you. And it will help create the conditions of suffering for everybody around you. I'm not responsible for the suffering of other people around me, but I can create the conditions to make it infinitely easier. If I'm a huge asshole to everybody around me, no, I'm not responsible for Gene getting mad, but damn, I didn't help at all, did I? Like I was trying to trigger him. 
So you can help create the conditions of suffering for people around you. And that is a responsibility that we have to take that's directly related to intention. Okay, what I recommend, assuming that all of these other points are in place, if they're not, back it up. Let's go back to the you know basics of our practice until it starts to gain momentum. And if you have questions about that, a one-on-one, -on -one, I can clarify it for you. Let's say it's all occurring. Let's say we have altered the lens of perception. We are in an altered state of awareness, i.e. an altered state of consciousness. We've altered it because the lens of perception is clear. We're not complaining. We're not upset. We're not overvaluing little things. Things are important because we make them important. We give them importance. But then again, it could all just go away with the wind too. I have peace. I have joy. I have happiness. I don't necessarily need anything else. If I do, great. If I find myself in a, in a luxurious hotel, I might enjoy myself for 10 or 15 minutes before I leave. And that's okay. Now, what I would recommend when we do start to interact with the behaviors that we find uninspiring, that we know is causing us to leak energy, we can look at it with this, with this Merkaba. What is your desire? Is it intelligent? If the answer is yes, these two are connected. Intelligent desire. Oh, isn't that cool? The idea of desire being directly related to intelligence, such as not wanting to kill one another. Wouldn't it be intelligent for a species to not implode and kill one another? Wouldn't we agree that that's an intelligent thing to do? Sure. So is that a desire? If it is, those two have started to interact with one another. Eventually, they'll overlap, and none of it will require thought. We're just assuming right now that it's it's not quite overlapped. Well, you can intend using your voice of power. So let's say that I'm walking to that, that piece of cake and I, I, my body wants it. That's biology. That's the biological destroyer. That's my gut biome using the axis of communication to my brain saying we would love some starchy, sugary food right now. That's fine. I can use my voice of power to remind myself of my desire that is connected to intelligence and that sparks intention. I desire a healthier body and more balance with my food. And then my voice of power will remind me that I don't have to declare war on cake or sugar or carbohydrates. But I know because of my feeling that that's going to take me out of balance. And I'm saying this to myself. This is my voice of power. Eventually, you won't need that necessarily. You can always use it if it's beneficial, but eventually these start to overlap. And the moment you feel it, you're just like, I'm good. It's that easy. And then habits start to just drop like they were nothing. So the intention will be something that I verbalize or I use my attention and then my attention and my intention are now overlapping. The will is another thing, though. The will is directly proportional to that first thing that I drew where the energy was going through. So the more personal power we have, the more will becomes easier. If uh, Let's use Donna as an example. And let's say she's not practicing and she's getting lost in thought. And now she has 99 problems and the world is crashing down and coast. No, she's not even coasting. There's just no practice whatsoever. Her power of will has been compromised. Does that make sense? Now, let's say Gene has just really put things together. He's really been maintaining points of attention. He redirects when he needs to. He's starting to feel this relaxation. The world doesn't feel so heavy. The burden of his own mind is off of his shoulders. He's really feeling powerful. He knows he can do anything he wants to do. His power of will is very strong. And then the desire that is connected to intelligence will connect to the intention, which is connected to attention, and the power of will takes care of itself. 
That's the formula for behavioral change. And I'm not going to give you all of the behavioral changes that I've made because that will start to sound, and some of them are a little personal. <laughs> so I don't, TMI, I don't want to share too many of these behavioral changes because you, you'd be like, you were doing that in the first place. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But things like overeating, cannabis, for example. Cannabis was out of balance, and I knew it, but I just didn't have the personal power to drop it like that. And I accepted that. And I used my internal dialogue to remind me that, just keep doing your thing. You don't have to declare war on the habit. You don't have to focus on habits, trying to quit and force yourself into a particular posture. Build personal power. How do you do that? Do your practice. How do you do that? Intention, deliberate attention. And then it all just starts to stack like Legos. And then before you know it, these behaviors that aren't serving us, we drop them or we find balance between them which is why I'm non-inhalant and which is why when I do collaborate with cannabis, it's after 6 p.m. So I don't veg out. I don't, I don't like the munchies. Does that make sense? But there are aspects to THC that I enjoy. I find it entertaining. If Gene took it away from me, fine. I hope you, I hope you like it. I'm okay without it too. I don't need it. It's fine. That's how you know you're free because you could have it or not have it. It's fine. Does that answer the question to the one who asked about the behavioral or uh, that particular entertainment destroyer? But all the destroyers will work the same way. It's not just entertainment. I was actually giving the example of biology with food, biology with sex, the way that we look at other people. How old, how old are we all now? Why would our life be a complex human mating ritual all the time? That would make no sense. But I, I look outside and I see people, you know, doing one thing or another, and it really just traces back to complex human mating rituals. We want to attract the opposite sex. We want them to look at us and be like, ooh, look at my glutes. Well, what else do you do with those glutes? Like, what, the, what are you doing? What requires you to squat 300 pounds? Nothing. That desire is not intelligent. Sorry. I mean, unless you use it. Let's say you're a firefighter. You probably need strong glutes to be a firefighter. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's relative, so nothing against glutes. But what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Is it just coming from these destroyers? Or is it coming from intelligent design? If all that makes sense, that is pretty much the gist of hydrostasy. Uh, and then we also, so I, I mentioned the destroyers, but we also start to interact with the enemies of knowledge. The first enemy of knowledge is distraction. I challenge you to go through Chicago and count the people who are not looking at their cell phones or are otherwise distracted. That will be difficult because they are all distracted. Uh, the first gate is when the head is relaxed you can sense into that space elongate that space and that will make dream walking possible it will also make because if you don't have that space how do you intend how you want to feel you have to have the space to do that if the mind is like worrying about all of this bullshit and trying to change compare contrast control male aggression i can almost I promise you it's impossible. i understand the reason i yeah. just didn't know what the terminology you were using that's the terminology so far, uh, and it's subject to change, though. So just, yeah. <laughs> Notes may yeah, change so time. That relaxed space in the inside of your... And, and not just creating it, engaging it. Yes. Yes. And then the dreamwalking effect, not just creating it, engaging it. Reminding yourself that, you know what? So what? My package got lost in the mail. I hope somebody finds it and appreciates it and benefits from it. I'm good. I am going to take steps to make sure that it doesn't happen again because I'm also not foolish. So I will get a tracking number next time. Does that make sense? I don't think I have anything else to add in hydrostasy because we start to interact with the enemies of knowledge and the four destroyers because this... Merkaba has become a sphere. 
They exist independently and simultaneously at the same time. And that's the hydrostatic effect. And we can always feel when we're moving in and out of that balance. It's a feeling and you know it. So you're about to go do that habit and you will have to hustle yourself and cherry pick in order to do it because your body won't your body will feel it. You'll feel the imbalance because you're going outside of your hydro hydrostatic bubble. And that's hydrostasy. And if we learn to maintain our hydrostatic bubble, intention, will, intelligence, wisdom, knowledge, all of these things, intention, I said intention, will, desire, they all start to overlap, interact. And before you know it, we are consciously creating the life that we want Without all of the previous notions, when someone first starts this practice, maybe their desire is to live on the beach and have no job and just have everybody tend to them. Never do the dishes. I want everybody to just bring me everything and I just don't want to do anything ever. Okay. However, after practicing this practice, that will very likely change. <laughs> That desire won't be the desire that you had once upon a time, because if that's required, you are trapped. If you feel like, oh, I just have to live on the beach or I'm just, I'm going to die. You are trapped. You are not free. If you can live on the beach and not live on the beach and still feel freedom, you're good. $800 to replace. Still have peace. Less money though. <laughs> and hopefully you can add that to your knowledge bank and it will impart unto wisdom, right? You shouldn't keep going through the same things again and again and again and again. Maybe there's a way to make sure that your, your battery doesn't die and it's not $800 to replace, or maybe you just need a different model of car or something. We don't want to continue to repeat the same experiment expecting a different result, such as accumulating information all the time, which can become another enemy of knowledge. It's called toxic knowledge or toxic information. Because all you're doing is accumulating, 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 and disseminating, and disseminating, and disseminating, and accumulating, and acting on absolutely none of it, or very little. And that's very common in the world today. I call that going from one type of thinking to a new type of thinking, thinking that the new type of thinking is somehow better thinking, and that it should apply to other people. Gene decides to become vegan because he doesn't like the way animals are treated. And then all of a sudden he thinks that his thinking is better thinking. And then he tries to tell other people how they should think and what they should do. And that is a gross error. That's it. That's the whole system from beginning to end. That is it. What else could I offer a person? They've changed their lens of perception. They've altered their own consciousness, their, their own conscious creator. They're building their own personal power you're not going to get anything from me that you can't already get yourself. We can talk about it and have a hoot, but I'm, I'm, I'm not a teacher at that point. And that's why I stopped the system at that point so that people can, however, the bridge system will continue, will create new practices because Gene just kind of created, well, he didn't create one, but he shared one today, one that he does. And that eventually that could become a part of the bridge system that we share with people. Two quick breaths, and then the rest of your inhale, it helps your mind relax and you can go to sleep. I don't have any trouble sleeping, so I probably won't do that. And I'll, you know, maybe I do. And then I'll be like, I remember Gene saying that this works. I'll give it a try. That could become a new technique, and it could even become a new practice, the way that we interact with our breath. But there's a certain point in the bridge mindfulness system and hydrostasy that they're there's just nothing else I have to offer. We're getting into intelligence. Intelligence is way beyond words. It doesn't need any words. And we get into what is more a silent type of knowledge. No words are necessary. No words will explain it. We just got to feel it, swim, and do. Does that make sense? And if we do try to share it, we end up with paintings like Ida or books like mine. Right, but this, like you've pointed out before, that coming to this group is a um, is a form of formal med uh, formal practice. It's a, a you know, it's intention well, <laughs> and then bringing, you know, it, it fits in the, um, in the in the scenario. It has all of the elements and all of the principles at play, and it serves that 
purpose, no matter what it is we talk about, or if we don't talk, if we just follow you and we do movement together, or if Ida brings her paintings or whatever it is, we, if we share techniques, it's still a formal practice to arrive at on a Thursday at whatever time zone you're in. So that when you say there's nothing left to share, there's plenty left That's to share. That's not what I mean. Yeah, no, no. I know what you mean. Yeah, Teach okay. is different than share. And yes. this group has has had that element of both all along. So, yeah. Yep. Behavioral change, it started, it didn't start, but, you know, I wasn't leaving the towel on the bed. Seems pretty minor. Now, when a woman gives me attention and she's super attractive, I could have that or not. I don't know. What's the difference? Before, I would have been like, oh, my gosh, they like Ernest. Isn't that great? I'm going to let myself go outside of my hydrostasy bubble. And who knows what kind of stuff? Well, we all know what kind of suffering that kind of stuff causes. But I'm I'm so far like it just none of that resonates anymore. It's like, and there's 7 billion people on Earth. At least half of them are cute. I just happen to be one of them. It's fine. See, that was a joke. Thank you. <laughs> so one other aspect of hydrostasy that I glossed over a little bit quickly was what Donna just mentioned, and that's the formal practice. The formal practice in hydrostasy is a formal four modes. I can make recommendations until I'm blue in the face. My movement aspect, you know, the we have standing. I, I really call it moving. It is usually when you're walking. That's a perfect opportunity to informally practice. But you can also go fox walk. You want to do it in a particular way at a particular time to go watch the sunrise. That could actually be a very formal type of movement practice. I do recommend things that involve more complex movement. I think that will be very beneficial for the physical body, more so than just walking. But I do agree that walking, fox walking is a formal practice if you if you do it that way, right? Walking from the house to the car, that's informal. And that's okay too. We have both because it's it's embodying both at this point in hydrostasy. When I do Tai Chi, when I do yoga, when I do these things, that the Qigong movements, that's my movement part of my formal practice. Exactly. Yep. That's the that's the formal part. I love to sit down and meditate now. Dr. John, I did it at the at the clinic the other day. She sat on the chair, did her full lotus, and she's like, you do it too. I sat down on the ground in the middle of the workday, and we did a three-minute meditation, and I had absolutely no thoughts whatsoever, not one. It's desirable now. I'm not trying to, to just, oh, I'm going to clear my mind, so I'm going to try to meditate in this weird... Who the, who, who, it's just such a weird thing. It's like now everybody thinks they need to do this. And and sometimes I was showing Shana, when you put your arms in weird positions that aren't proportional to your body, you end up doing this. And now I'm meditating and my knees are up to my ears. <laughs> That's fine, you know, but that might not be for your body. Your hand placement could be proportional to your body. <laughs> And then also people who are doing this with their, you're not going to do that for long because you're cutting off, you're, the blood isn't going to flow well to your hands. So you're doing this for a picture. It's a photo op. You're not doing that for 20 minutes a day. Stop. So the standing meditation, I do a formal standing meditation. I make it really simple. You can do just the golden line. You can do Zen Zhuan. But it's time in hydrostasy to add formal practice. Remember in the beginning, I don't do that. I don't touch on any of that stuff in the beginning. I don't want to talk about behavior. I don't want to talk in the very beginning. I don't even want to talk about interacting with thought. That's not the place for it in the very beginning. But eventually we start to interact with thought. Eventually we start to interact with behavior. Eventually we start to interact with the enemies of knowledge to make sure that we're not hustling ourselves and zigging when we should be zagging, et cetera. And then this is a complete mindfulness and evolution of consciousness system. Any questions? Oh, 
Okay. If you ever, you know, want to go over any of that <laughs> ever again, just let me know. Uh, I can talk all day about behaviors that haven't changed because there's just not enough personal power there. I can feel it. It feels like force to try to control it. So certain things, it's like, you know, I'm going to put that on the back burner and just wait to feel more personal power. And then they just start to drop. They just start to fall off like nothing. Gene had a, a jolt when his doctor said that he wouldn't help him until he quit smoking. That caused a jolt of personal power, intention and will, intelligence, desire. His desire was to see the doctor because he wanted to get healthy. Intelligently, his body is communicating with him and telling him that if he doesn't, he's going to die. And that's self-preservation. That's a type of intelligence that will come up when you need it to, hopefully, if you're not in that the way of that. And then the personal power for that moment flowed through him that he dropped cigarettes on a dime. That might not be as easy with other things because it doesn't have all those other elements. And I think that's fine. You know, I'm, I would never declare war on that because he's smoke free now. So that worked. However, what I'm talking about is creating it naturally and we can do it with all of the imbalances that exist. Because most of these things aren't good or bad in and of themselves. If somebody wants to have multiple relationships, they want to do things with their sexual energy, but they're very deliberate, they're very mindful, they're very focused. Who am I to judge? Do your thing. Can you go with it as easily as without it? That's the that's the key. That's what we need to look at to evaluate the element of freedom. And if that's not there, you're in an imbalance, I can almost assure you. Okay. And that is the complete bridge mindfulness system from beginning to end. I would say that this is the first time that we've actually gone through those other elements. I've never shared those elements before, but they, they've been in my notes here for a long time. And I don't have anything else after that. If <clears throat> the two gates are there, the lens of perception will change on its own. Everything going through that lens of perception will be different. Therefore, all of our actions will be fundamentally different. All the output, including our thoughts, will be different. We'll find ourselves more compassionate, more kind, more caring, more generous. All of these things will just start to occur on their own. Uh, but it only works if you do it. It's not a, it's not a thinking exercise. All right, I can take questions if anyone's got them. Uh, the four destroyers, and there's the secret fifth. We never interact with the secret fifth. That's why I've put it as the fifth. You never interact with that directly. However, you can, using the behavioral format that I showed, you can evaluate the other four. The first, and they're in no particular order, biology. That's a Dickens. That's a tough one. But I'm I'm not a primitive mammal. <laughs> I can, I can do more with my behavior. I don't have to be like, well, you know, I'm just a man. Oh, bullshit. So biology, society, social influences. And remember, this all relates to the nemesis. The nemesis is a mind that is operating below the level of deliberate recognition. And you feed these destroyers, whether you like it or not. And then before you know it, you're reading and you're watching TV and all of a sudden you're just eating up everything they tell you. And now Bill Gates has put a microchip in our vaccines. Or 5G is causing coronavirus. Or the Queen of England was a lizard person. And that Joe Biden has three body doubles. It's like, guys, come on. I don't know two other people that look like Joe Biden. Uh, which one? So we had biology. Which ones did I say? Uh, so biology is one of the society and uh, the habits that we have created already. We'll continue to feed those. And that's a very individual thing. All right. So we have habit, society, biology, entertainment. That's the four destroyers. Got them. And the secret fifth, which we don't secret. talk about. The secret fifth is the collective human momentum, 
which is the another reason that we're in the hot mess that we're in is because it has accumulated momentum over time. And it is the fifth destroyer that will destroy the human species if left unchecked. And the only way to dissolve the destroyers is to address the nemesis. The way that we address the nemesis is by operating above the level of recognition called deliberate attention. Let's see, I have the enemies of knowledge written down. There was one that was just a little bit confusing in how I wanted to deliver it though. Let me see where I got it. I got files and notes and notebooks and this is what Donna's gonna do someday is organize all this shit for me. Chapter list, extra worksheets. Uh, I think it's in the back of the masters of attention. This is how I organize my books now. I have chapter sheets. I organize the thoughts. I make sure that it's it's consistent and coherent. That way I don't end up with a story like the Cypher of the Divine where it's like it ends completely different than it began and halfway through the middle we're doing a completely different, yeah. So the first one is distraction. Distraction is an enemy of knowledge. You cannot pay attention to the present moment if you're distracted, and that's where we learn. With cognitive attention training, sensory attention training, behavioral attention training, we learn from the present moment, not the therapist who wants to take us back into the past. So the distracted mind isn't paying attention to the lessons. The best it can do is recollect and learn in a lag. Does that make sense? And I don't mean this the way that people in the new, like, you're, you're, the world's so distracted, you don't see what they're doing. No, I mean, you're distracted from the moment itself. Distracted in your thoughts, distracted in your phone, distracted in the four destroyers. Does that make sense? Distraction is an enemy of knowledge. It's very difficult to gain personal experience, learn from personal experience, accumulate new information when you're just completely distracted. It can be done to a certain extent, but it's always a delay. You'll have to learn after the fact. Does that make sense? So it's an enemy, it's an enemy of presence. Which is also an enemy of knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Because if it's, you're not present. It's your personal not, experience because you're not. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or even information. You can miss so much information because you're not paying attention. You could have literally just told me the most profound thing ever. The th that one sentence that just makes everything. And I wasn't listening. I was too busy in my own thought, looking at my phone, wondering when the hell you're going to shut up. You, I was distracted. Of course, number two is ignorance. You have no knowledge. That's the opposite of, of, of knowledge is ignorance. And that's a person who's just stopped learning. Yeah, that's icky. <laughs> Number three is information. Information itself can become toxic and it can become an enemy of knowledge because it is out of balance. You have so much information, it's not really lending to personal experience. If there's balance, then that implies that you have information and personal experience, and that creates the three parts of knowledge. Right, like coming to class, learning the system, taking a bunch of notes, and never practicing. Being You've there. accumulated a bunch of information, but it's not worth shit unless you're actually doing it, because you're the... getting no personal experience from it. And then you can't even relate to the experience of others because you don't have any of your own from which to draw conclusions or... Absolutely. Um, and this is kind of a spoiler because I do talk about all of these in my book. Oh, I have one other thing. Oh, no, there's one other aspect to hydrostasy. And I'll talk about that in a second then. Since I'm just finishing, uh, since I'm delivering all this anyway, I'll just finish it. We have a, as long as you're here. Uh, number four is personal power. This is tricky, but in as we start to accumulate personal power in the beginning, if there's no balance and we're not 
doing it in the way that I have recommended, then our own personal power can become an enemy of knowledge. I'll give you an example, and it's kind of a shitty example on my part. But in about 2015, I was doing a lot of intention and will. And, you know, some females started to show me uh, interest. They're like, oh, earnest, personal power. And I was untethered. I was all over the place. I was directing that personal power in a way that was feeding the four destroyers. Does that make sense? So our own personal power, if we're not careful, can become an enemy to knowledge. And the fifth one, and this one's a doozy, fear. I'm talking about psychological fear too, by the way, uh, imbalanced fear. Uh, Gene, if a bear breaks through your window right now, I recommend fear. I recommend fight or flight. In fact, I recommend flight. Unless you've been working out and you're just ready to fight a bear, uh, I recommend flight. <laughs> oh, that's when the pressing of the 300 pounds and having strong glutes comes in your favor. There you go. There You, you never knew when you were going to need to suppress a bear. Better to be ready than not. And I'm going to ask a person the next time I, and when it gets springtime and everybody starts wearing their short shorts and they all have these like perfectly sculpted glutes and we're like, you're preparing for a bear. I know it. Uh, and then the sixth enemy of knowledge is the one that we just can't avoid as far as I know, and that's death. Because your brain is no longer able to sustain the information and the knowledge or the information, uh, the personal experience or the experience of others, which is why communication is a really good thing because then we can impart that knowledge unto others even after our brain is no longer able. Uh, no, I'm no, not no. getting you, I'm not following. How, what, death, death is a enemy of knowledge because you're dead? Yes. <laughs> and then also because we fear it. And I don't wanna get too far into the possibility of intelligence and other aspects of the human being continuing after. So if we focus too much on our own death, usually out of fear, and I'm not talking about death as your advisor either, it can become an enemy of knowledge. We stop learning and then we invent religion. Because we're afraid of death, we have to make up all of this shit. No offense to anybody <laughs> who believes in certain things. I mean, organized religion is a system of control. Not necessarily religious beliefs. You know, anytime you want to create a system of control, it's best to do use kernels of truth. Truth. That's a phrase that I don't use very often. And the more you think about it, the more you're going to stumble. So this is something that you, with the other aspects of hydrostasy you'll be able to feel and when death is no longer your enemy you can learn so much more about life and it usually stems from fear so you can't touch on death until you've learned to interact with your own psychological fears and again fear plus nor minus up nor down good nor bad i'm not like we must have no fear because i think you're full of shit if you say that <laughs> it's just another thing that people do when they go from one type of thinking to another type of thinking thinking that the new thinking is better thinking they'll come up with all kinds of bullshit no ego no fear no suffering i'm gonna punch you in the mouth when you say that now let me know if you're suffering it hurts huh Uh, and then we have the virtues of human cognition. And that's the end. Uh, that's the last aspect of hydrostasy that I forgot to share. Actually, I shared it in the beginning. Imagination is one of those. Um, and these, you know, you guys maybe can add some, but we have music, humor, imagination, memory, the way that we can interact with our memory and remember things in vivid detail. I, I'm probably missing a couple because they're written down somewhere else, but those beautiful aspects of human cognition that we can embrace, even communication at times can be a wonderful thing that human beings can do. 
And the more that we're in that hydrostatic circle, or what I call the hydrostatic effect, the more this all just naturally starts to occur. Creativity. We, we just start to embrace these things so much more. And then how can you be bored? The birds are playing music. The wind is playing music. I am a highly creative individual. <laughs> There's no boredom there. I don't, I don't need, you know, war video games to feel something. <laughs> What's the title of this you're calling them? Uh, I, I was kind of calling them the virtues of human cognition. I, but I don't like the word virtues. So I would just say that these are the attributes of the evolution of consciousness so far. I would assume the more that we do this, we'll add to those virtues of, of co cognition. It's a, it, I, I can't imagine them right now, though. <laughs> it could look a lot like extrasensory perception and things like that, our ability to perceive in different ways. I do believe that that's possible, because why did we find a flower beautiful in the first place? You know, Gene is trying to protect the tribe from bears. He didn't need to find the sunset beautiful to do that. So I view that as an indication of the evolution of consciousness. And as I discussed in the first essential teaching, because I have 20 essential teachings, the first essential teaching, I kind of discussed that. I know that's a new thing, but I've organized it. Uh, but the 20 essential teachings that one of the ones that we talked about was, you know, why do we find a flower beautiful? Because when the human being got to the top of the food chain, the physical aspect was less important because we could build houses. We could build, we could change the environment to suit the human being. We could farm, we could hunt, we could do these things. And so we didn't need to worry about our physical survival. So the human body, you know, is evolving differently as a result of the evolution of consciousness. So dolphins, when they get to the top of the food chain and they swim around for a few million years, the mind has the opportunity to evolve even more. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then who knows, maybe one day we'll be walking around like dolphins with echolocation, you know, communicating with different aspects of the universe around us. I already do that, but I also think, I just I just think it's below the level of of, of uh, cognition. Hmm. Yeah, that's it. I can't remember yesterday. <laughs> All right. Any questions about hydrostasy? That is pretty much the whole hydrostatic practice. Uh, the, the root of it, the practice of it, is the four directions and the four modes. The four modes being embodied and formal. It's time to do some formal practices in hydrostasy. It won't feel like, if it feels like force, it's not time. Let your personal power accumulate. You'll feel when it's time. All of a sudden, you'll be sitting there and you're like, damn, I really just want to sit down with a straight back and meditate. It feels really good. As opposed to, I need to meditate because I'm in a terrible mental state. Any questions, comments, concerns? That will all be delivered in my creative writing as well. So uh, right now, I no, I'm not going to foreshadow that. I want that to be a part of the surprise of the book. But I'm working on the Masters of Attention right now. This one. And I look at the word mastery in a different way. Because mastery was a word that I don't like the way that it's used most often. But the word mastery is neither good nor bad, plus nor minus, up nor down. I don't like the way that it's used when it's power over someone. Uh, that's how it would be used in the slavery context. I won't say Gene can have a seat at the master's table. Mm, where did that come from? And I don't say master bedroom anymore. I use the, yeah, because master bedroom is a derivative of slavery. The master's bedroom. Yeah, so I call it the main bedroom or the, the primary living space. <laughs> But mastery is a word that we use to describe a feeling. 
and most people don't look at it this way. But let's say Gene is an engineer. And outside of engineering, he's all over the fucking place. <laughs> like he has no peace in his life in general. But when he goes to do his engineering, his tools are precise. Everything is an art. He's totally focused. He's locked in. That's mastery. He has, and it doesn't mean that there's no learning and that he's better than everybody. He has entered a state of mastery. You can feel it. Bob was giving me a massage and I hope Bob watches this. This is a compliment. I didn't really care for the massage because I didn't need it. And I felt like somebody rolled me down a hill gently again and again and again. And I'm like, my whole body is like oddly not that sore, but sore. And I didn't really care for that effect. But his hands, the way that he directed his hands, sometimes he would go so slow, so slight. And I knew that I was feeling the master's touch. He had mastered technique and it was in his practice and what he was doing. When I touched hands with a certain pushed hands practitioner, I knew that I was sensing mastery. It's a feeling of, of a very high level of deliberate attention, will, and everything else. When you're with me and we're doing the practice, you will sense mastery. Now, that does that mean that I'm, no, that, that's what people use the word erroneously. And it is comparing and contrasting and labeling and judging and better than, worse than. That's not how I'm looking at it. I'm looking at mastery as a feeling. Does that make sense? And the and the mastery as a feeling comes from intention, will, and desire overlapping. Just do. And do with and precision and accuracy. And the accumulation of that. Absolutely. Yes. It didn't just happen overnight. It happened because of practice and, and the accumulation principle. And every single one of us can be a master of attention. Uh, however, are you doing it right now? If the answer is no, there is no mastery. If are there you is, practicing mastering your attention or well, it, are you not? <laughs> exactly. Well, if you're practicing, you are learning to master attention. Right. You're practicing yes. mastering your yes. attention. Yes. Uh, I would be careful about wording it that way to other people, though, because then they would look at it as the comparing I and the contrasting. And I have mastered. Context. Yeah. <laughs> But in the context of the way that we're using it, if your desire is to do your practice, your intention is to do your practice, and you have the personal power necessary to maintain your practice, there is mastery. And typically, it's other people who will say it, not you, because they feel it from you. It's not something necessarily that you feel within yourself. I feel that from other people. And so when other people start saying you're a master of attention, then maybe it's there. <laughs> because Gene isn't thinking about being a master of the engineering when he's doing it. He's focused. There's intention and will and personal power, no mastery. Like that's not that's not a, a concept that is, but somebody else watching it, they can feel the master's touch. That's how I'm using the word, and I'll describe that in the book. Soul makes that distinction because I'm confused about that in the book. I'm like, well, isn't this a contradiction? It can be if we're if we're contradicting ourselves. All right. Any questions, comments, concerns before we head out? All right. I will upload this. There is a Facebook page called the Weekly Mindfulness Group. I will upload these into YouTube and then into the weekly mindfulness group. Uh, if you like it, feel free to share it. As you know, I'm not really interacting with my own Facebook page that way anymore. All right. Well, I will see everybody again on Tuesday as we dive into the second essential teaching. And I'm not going to say my own name because that sounds weird. but I have broken it down into seven cores, 20 essential teachings. And then those essential teachings, when we break it down even further, becomes the bridge mindfulness practice. Easy. And the first 
or the second two layers of the bridge mindfulness practice is the transcendental embodiment approach. We haven't embodied anything in fundamental mindfulness, fundamental training. So that's not really a part of T. And hydrostasy is its own thing. So that's not really a part of T either. But T is the requirement for hydrostasy. They stack like Legos on top of one another. And I do believe that in some ways we have shared some of the most profound things that we could share as human beings inside of this two hours and 11 minutes, 13 minutes. And I'll share it on Facebook and it'll get two or three likes. That's just the way it goes. All right. Well, I will see you guys again on Tuesday if you can make it. Uh, the questions and the comments that you send me throughout the week is what fueled today's uh, I didn't come with these because Ernest wants to talk about this shit. I had some people ask about the destroyers. Gene and I started talking earlier about, you know, how do we interact with our practice when we feel physically unwell? So sometimes I'll take the questions that people ask me throughout the week and I'm like, well, well now wait a second. I don't want to answer this all in messenger when I can make it a part of the group study that other people can benefit from. The last thing I'll say is that hydrostasy and the bridge mindfulness system has uh, a type of teaching and sharing mechanism that is more akin to martial arts. Uh, Donna, Jean, everybody here who's practicing, embodying your practice, we can talk about it, but I will certify you to share this system. The only thing that you need to do is to share it. Share it with other people so that they can benefit from it too. How do you want to do that? I don't fucking care. <laughs> you know, if Donna wants to do classes and book studies, that's good. If Gene doesn't want to do anything at all, except for when people ask him questions, right on. And do you have to be, you know, mastering every aspect of the practice? No. You know, I think that there's four layers. And based on those four layers, I think that you're perfectly capable and qualified to share certain aspects. I've given Donna, absolutely, she can share the first three aspects. And the more we talk about hydrostasy, she's probably going to be able to share hydrostasy as well if she, if, if, if she chooses to. But I'd like to give permission. Uh, Lisa, you've been doing this since the dawn of the, the beginning of the practice. You can describe the fundamental practice and counterbalance as good as anybody, probably. For example. Uh, we would need to talk about it a little bit. I would like to do a one-on-one -on -one just so we could make sure uh, that we're on the same page. But uh, I am going to uh, give these certificates to those who are interested in sharing. And I'm probably going to give you one whether you like it or not. And then you can do whatever you want with it. Okay, I will see you guys later. I'll post this up to YouTube today and then post it to the Facebook page that is the weekly mindfulness study. Um, mindfulness is probably a word I'm going to slowly start to phase out because it's getting icky. All right, well, I will see you guys again soon on Tuesday. All right, bye everyone. See ya.